Good morning and welcome. I'm going to continue along the same lines as Dr. Subramanian and emphasize evidence-based medicine. The criticism that we frequently encounter in anti-aging medicine is lack of scientific methods, shall we say. And what I'm trying to do this morning is to explain a little bit about why we should stick with scientific methods and how we um, can find those scientific methods in order to make our therapy so much more credible. Both NAMS and the OBGYN societies criticize what we do as far as bioidentical hormone replacement therapy because they say that there's um, no placebo-controlled trials to support what we do. And w which is true. There are no studies looking at compounded hormones uh, providing any benefit or any, shall we say, long-term health benefit um, in comparison with the uh, FDA trials looking at synthetic hormones. Uh, taking it one step further, we sort of lack credibility because uh, a recent FDA survey demonstrated that over 34 percent of compounded hormones failed potency tests. So this is why, unfortunately, we have a lack of credibility as far as mainstream medicine is concerned because of lack of, shall we say, scientific method. Uh, nevertheless, why do we do bioidentical hormones? Why do we preach bioidentical hormones? Uh, there's a plethora of data out there and studies showing the, the superior efficacy and safety of pharmaceutical bioidentical hormones, which is sort of why we do hormone replacement therapy. We sort of follow the guidelines we've been instructed by our studies to follow um, their lead as to the results of their studies showing that these hormones are very, very safe in comparison with perhaps other studies showing that the non-bioidentical or synthetic chemically altered hormones are not safe. So how does a pr practitioner follow these guidelines? How do we assure that what we're prescribing and what we're utilizing is efficacious? That's what this lecture is about. What I want to do is to give you little pieces of a puzzle and at the end I will try to put all the pieces of the puzzle together so that you can see a whole picture and explain to you why we need to do what we do, but we still need to use scientific method. Um, many lecturers will not use the medical literature to support their claims or to support what they do. Uh, and all of my teachings and the courses that we teach, I make sure that everything that we do and say is evidence-based. So what does our literature instruct us to do? What should we follow? How do we make this more credible? Um, and what sort of guidelines should we follow? It's really set forth in the scientific literature. All we have to do is look at those guidelines and follow them. So adhering to the medical research standards appears to be probably the most logical course to assure that what we're prescribing and what we're doing is equal to, if not more efficacious, um, than the pharmaceutical bioidenticals that have been well supported in the medical literature. There's a multitude of health benefits of estrogen, which I will not go through. But nevertheless, we need to understand that when we lose estrogen, we lose all of these tremendous health benefits. And this is what we want to make sure that we treat by providing adequate therapy. And many of us perhaps do not prescribe adequate enough levels in order to provide all of these benefits which have been well demonstrated in the medical literature. There's also many benefits of progesterone too and a lot of us fail to follow scientific standards as far as progesterone administration is concerned. There's an extremely beneficial effect of progesterone in protecting against breast cancer which is what I will get into later in this talk which is why it's so important that we follow scientific standards. There's also protection against uterine cancer, heart disease, osteoporosis, etc. And the medical literature that looks at this and shows and demonstrates that this is beneficial, are the, the data is all from FDA trials looking at a certain prescription of a hormone that has been studied and adequately shown to be protective. What happens when we lose estrogen? Um, many practitioners and many of the ones that I'm familiar with will say, well, I don't think women really need that much estrogen. They, they already make estrogen. They've got plenty of estrogen as it is. The average estradiol level in a premenopausal woman is 100. The average um, milligrams per deciliter estradiol in a postmenopausal woman is 20. So we go from an average of 100 down to 20. And when we go to 20, we will tend to lose beneficial effects and cause a lot of these things to occur. 
Maintaining adequate estradiol levels, according to the medical literature, can help protect against a lot of these problems. But do we maintain those levels as demonstrated by the literature? In my experience, most of us do not.